Dr. Philip Goff is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Liverpool, specialising in philosophy of mind. In this interview and discussion, he addresses some of the philosophical problems behind the definitions of consciousness, materialism and physicalism. Essentially, when we talk about consciousness, philosophy of mind and its overlap perhaps with neuroscience, the first basic point we need is, what is a mind? Uh, I suppose there are two different ways of defining mentality in a kind of philosophically interesting way. One in terms of thought and one in terms of consciousness. And it's quite interesting actually that in, in 20th century uh, Anglo-American philosophy of mind, thought and consciousness were treated as completely different things to be accounted for in very different ways. And you can see this, for example, in uh, many of the dominant theories of thought in the 20th century, for example, by Jerry Fodor or Donald Davidson, uh, they had absolutely nothing to say about consciousness. So you can see that they just thought, you know, we can talk about thought without saying anything about consciousness. Whereas in the 21st century, there's a lot, many philosophers kind of railing against this and saying, well, now hold on, it's, these two things aren't completely separate, that you can't um, give a theory of thought without talking about consciousness, because perhaps thought just is a kind of consciousness or, or is grounded in a certain kind of conscious experience. So, so there's controversy about the, whether, these, whether thought and consciousness are independent of each other or whether they're closely related. But nonetheless, I suppose there are these two starting points. Um, so maybe I should just explain to you how, how, how these things are defined. So, again, I, I would follow Thomas Nagel, the standard definition of consciousness, that according to which a thing is conscious if there's something that it's like to be it. So there's something that it's like for a rabbit to be cold or to be kicked or to have a knife stuck in it. In contrast, there's nothing that it's like, or so we ordinarily suppose, for a table to be cold or to be kicked or to have a knife shoved in it. So there's nothing that it's like from the inside, as it were, to be a table. And so we mark this difference by saying that the rabbit, but not the table, is conscious. So it's important to note that uh, consciousness on this standard philosophical definition does not involve anything kind of cognitively sophisticated of the kind you might be reluctant to ascribe to non-human animals. So I think, I think this contrasts sometimes the way the words used outside of philosophy or uh, just in general parlance, in common parlance. It sometimes mean, meant to use, mean something kind of sophisticated, like maybe self-consciousness or awareness of self. That's not generally how philosophers use it. They just use it to mean any kind of inner experience, inner life. So that's how I tend to use the word consciousness. Thought. Um, thoughts are mental states that involve propositions in some sense. So propositions are things expressed by that clauses. So things like that London is the capital of England that it's a sunny day, that I will die soon. So these are propositions. So mental thoughts are mental states that involve propositions. So for example, believing that London is the capital of England, uh, hoping that it's a sunny day, uh, fearing that I'm going to die soon. So, so the, the, these are thoughts. So I suppose they're, they're the two standard ways of starting to think about mentality as, as uh, consciousness, having some kind of inner life or inner experience or thought mental state that involve propositions. And I suppose these are philosophically interesting because uh, philosophers have found it difficult to incorporate these two aspects of mentality in our kind of standard scientific picture of the world of sort of philosophical interest. If we talk about a, a basic conscious experience, that may be anything just that involves a basic sensational phenomenon. So it may not necessarily have to be with an inner state. Uh, I don't know how, how you feel about that. For example, uh, we do know what it's like to be human. Uh, we probably wouldn't all know what it's like to be a bat because obviously they don't have advanced cognitive experiences and processes like we do. But uh, from what you've just elaborated on there, that any kind of conscious experience basically has to be a state that it's like to be something. So what it's like to be a rabbit or a bat and then thought on the other side because it deals with these statements of propositions are more likely to be tied in with a general analysis logic and rationality for example we couldn't expect a rabbit or a bat to have logical propositions to the state that human consciousness has how do you feel about this what would you say in this area 
Yeah, that sounds about right. So, um, so the, the standard definition of consciousness is just any kind of inner life and experience. So it's pretty uncontroversial that rabbits have uh, consciousness, although Descartes thought they were just mechanisms, famously. But um, I guess most of us think rabbits have inner experience of some kind. And as you said, uh, this standard definition comes from a very famous paper of Thomas Nagel, What's It Like to Be a Bat, where he dis discusses... Um, if we can understand that the, the inner life of a bat, because it has such a different way of experiencing the world, as, as it echolocates primary, as its primary way of getting around the world, which is something which he supposes must involve a kind of inner experience we can't really relate to. Um, whereas it's much less obvious, at least, put it that way, that, as you say, rabbits or bats have thought. This is something much more cognitively sophisticated, something linked to um, propositions, reasoning. Um, I mean, it's, it, some people think we should say that animals have thought, or maybe that they have proto-thought in some sense, something on, on, on the way to thought. Um, but yeah, it's, it's much less obvious. But as I say, that the connection between thought and consciousness is contentious. So so I'm inclined to the to the view people who sometimes talk about phenomenal intentionality, rather technical term. I'm inclined to the view that thought uh, of this kind of propositional kind uh, just is a very sophisticated kind of consciousness. So I, I'm inclined to, go, but, but that's a philosophically controversial view. So um, uh, I guess still probably the orthodox view is is that we can distinguish these two elements and um, treat them theoretically in very different ways. I like the way you've summed it up with a proto thought because this, to a certain extent, nicely leads into the next question that I, I want to pose to you, which is a lot of people today do think that human cognition and thought is just this advanced form of conscious experience, both internally and externally, in terms of how we analyze our world around us. So, okay, some animals are conscious, even apes are, are very, very uh, highly cognitive in terms of general uh, basic problems obviously they can't haven't got functions for languaging but they're, they're still very advanced as compared to bats and this kind of brings it into the question of if we have a mind and consciousness and sometimes we can put them together or sometimes we can separate them and perhaps our thinking process is just an advanced form of consciousness as opposed to other animals then what can be said philosophically of the role of the brain in this because if animals have brains but then they don't have consciousness like us but we have the largest and most complex brain so how would you address the area of brain and its relation to mind and consciousness i suppose i am strongly inclined to the view that what goes on inside our skulls ultimately accounts for thought and consciousness in, in humans and in other animals. Um, I'm inclined to do without the hypothesis of souls, for example, think it is just a matter of goings on in our brains. But I, I would want to qualify that instantly. It, so let me say a bit more to, to make my view clearer that um, some, I mean, I'm, I'm strongly of the view that we're not going to really make progress accounting for consciousness just from doing more neuroscience. Because um, I think, you know, what we get from neuroscience ultimately are correlations between brain states and conscious states. The neuroscience can tell us sophisticated information about which brain states go with which conscious states. So, you know, maybe look inside our heads, brain scientists might discover that, you know, the feeling of pain always goes with brain state X. Right, you know, so every time people are, are in brain state X, they they feel pain, and vice versa. Whenever they feel pain, they're in brain state X. These two always go together. I mean, I'm sort of ludicrously oversimplifying, but I think this is the, the kind of information we get from brain science about the correlations between brain states and conscious states. But I think merely this kind of information about correlations isn't yet a complete theory of consciousness. What we want for a complete theory of consciousness is to explain those correlations, right? You know, why is it that the feeling of pain always goes with brain state X and vice versa? And it's only when we've got that explanation of correlations that we have a complete theory of consciousness. So I suppose, and this is the more kind of philosophical aspect of the project. So I suppose I'm pitting myself against, I mean, there are some philosophers or uh, scientists who think that really to make progress on, on consciousness, we really need to just 
just do more brain science or more theorizing that's closely connected to empirical and scientific investigation. People like Daniel Dennett, Georges Ray, and, and, they, and, and they might put across the kind of view that if, if people like me who think we need to do something else other than just neuroscience, I might be branded as kind of anti-science or something and you know, grouped along with you know, people who deny climate change or believe in magic or something. Um, but I, I think this relies on a kind of oversimplistic conception of science, right? As though, as though science is always a matter of just kind of doing your experiments and reading off the data and that's the end of it. Whereas I think certainly at the more theoretical end of science, there's, there's, there's plenty of scope for progress being made by, for example, conceptual innovation, kind of coming up with new ways of thinking about the world or deep thinking about the nature of possibility. So my favorite example, if you think of Einstein coming up with special relativity in 1905, you know, he wasn't going out doing experiments. He was spending a lot of time thinking about what it's like, what it would be like to ride on a beam of light. You know, would that be possible to go at the same speed as light and what would follow from that? Or, you know, with general relativity later on, there's, there's incredible conceptual innovation. Um, so I'm of the view that really if we to make progress on consciousness, we, it is ultimately, I think, about what's going on in the brain. But it's not, we're not going to really get there by just doing more. I mean, I don't want to under, underrate the importance of brain science and empirical investigation of the brain. But I don't think in and of itself that's going to do it. I think we're going to need conceptual innovation. We're going to need to radically rethink our, our, our ordinary ways of thinking about the world if we're going to really find a place for consciousness. So, so yes, I suppose, although I am, ultimately I think we're going to, we're going to explain consciousness in terms of what goes on in our brain, I don't think just doing more neuroscience is going to do the trick. That's uh, very much a contemporary concern for both philosophers and neuroscience in this field. So, for example, clearly neuroscientists only have correlations and anyone that studied 101 philosophy of science or general scientific practice knows that correlation obviously isn't causation explanation. Obviously, your demand for having why it is that brain state X causes a phenomenon Y obviously needs an additional explanation and it's uh, very interesting because Sue Blackmore in this area as well was saying that we need to move on beyond this and have a, a different kind of conceptual innovation around what the mind is because sometimes when we have to face it against neuroscience we either fall into the standard Cartesian dualism or even a materialist dualism that's something that Dennett's uh, written about how the mind after we do all this neuroscience people still think that the mind is somehow the substance of the mind is produced separately from the brain and really not only are they the same thing materially but conceptually we have to move beyond just having brain and mind and com combine them as, as one obviously um einstein with um how he came up with a new definition of what space time actually is would be very much needed um in this area and very clearly there express some of the philosophical issues behind a study of the mind and its relation to neuroscience are there any more that we should take on board right now i mean that the issue with the hard problem was quite pivotal a few years ago i've seen lately that not so many people taking that on board as they first for example um hammeroff and penrose and quantum consciousness is basically just filling in gaps with mystery and void some think the issue of um internal uh, conscious experience and qualia you don't know what it's like when tony sees red because only tony knows what it's like when he sees red that's uh, also a bit problematic what are the the fundamental philosophical issues in this area if you could uh, explain some of those more yeah maybe i could talk a little about the, the, the view i favor and seeing as it's into what you've said there about dennett and blackmore maybe, maybe i could contrast the kind of conceptual innovation i think we need in contrast to the kind of conceptual innovation uh, they think we need. So, I mean, as I understand them, I think I think Dennett and uh, Susan Blackmore think we need to rethink our understanding of consciousness to solve the mind-body problem. Whereas I'm more inclined to think, you know, what, what what we need is to rethink our understanding of a physical world, right? So, 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 so um, maybe you could put it this way. So, I'm, I'm attracted to a view um, known as Rossellian monism. And it's called Vasily Monism because of the influence of uh, Bertrand Russell in shaping this view in the uh, 1920s. It's a kind of old view, and Eddington 
had some similar thoughts. 